if we feel fine and we think we're in good, good enough shape and we're eating well, are there certain tests you still want us to get? Medical tests? That's, yeah, that's a great question. You know, if, um, and, and my, my answer to that, what I'll say is this, my answer to that is evolving. So here's what, I, what my answer today is. The answer is yes. Uh, if we, let's say we're eating a healthy, raw plant-based diet, we're exercising, sleeping well, we're managing our stress well, um, we are all still in this toxic environment. You know, we're all living in earth, we're breathing this air, we're, we're consuming water. You may go on vacation and stay in a hotel and shower in the hotel water. You, you have the chance of being exposed to toxins on a regular basis. So having said that, we tend to recommend that our clients get basic blood tests. We look at kidney function, et cetera, but we also recommend micronutrient deficiency testing. Um, we also recommend, to a certain extent, measuring for toxic metals that may be in the blood. Uh, we plan to start measuring for zeoestrogens. Uh, that may get in the blood periodically. So understanding the level of toxins that you're exposed to, even though you're feeling well, you're healthy, uh, I think can be beneficial because, you know, you can monitor that and then you can do certain things to to uh, reverse those things, certainly re re reduce your exposure to them. Uh, and so, you know, if you have a lot of glyphosate in your your system, uh, you may want to look at the plant foods that you're exposed to and make a change, get locally grown, et cetera. So there are a lot of things that you can do uh, by just simply monitoring the amount of toxins in your blood. So that's, I think, would be a great health practice. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Um, Dr. Montgomery, um, do you have any nutritional supplements that you feel like we should be taking? What we find in our practice on a fairly regular basis is uh, magnesium deficiency, in which we recommend. Of course, you know, being a cardiology practice, and we see patients with all sorts of ailments, uh, but certainly people with cardi cardiovascular disease may come in with arrhythmias or symptoms of arrhythmias. They come with high blood pressure, so we measure RBC magnesium. We try to get some idea of the, the tissue level of magnesium. Uh, and so we see a fair amount of magnesium deficiency because we're looking for it. We see a fair amount of vitamin D deficiency. We're looking for it. Uh, so vitamin D, magnesium are, 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 are things that we supplement a fair amount. Uh, coenzyme Q10, certainly with our heart failure patients. Um, and, and, you know, vitamin C, much of that you get from your foods, but sometimes we'll use that in a target supplementation as well as curcumin. Uh, we have a liposomal curcumin that we use uh, for a lot of our patients with systemic inflammatory conditions, uh, arthritic conditions and the like. So we use them in a target fashion to help early on with symptom relief. And then we optimize their nutrition. And then, you know, and then we'll fine tune the supplements that we may recommend based on micronutrient testing or, or, or based on toxins that we measure or the like. Okay, Mona, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Yes, I'm from Savannah, Georgia. And I have had a, I have a question about SVTs for one thing, but this is in regards to it. My sleep study was done prior to going whole food plant-based and um, it was done without my CPAP on. Since then I've been going, I've been doing whole food plant-based strictly without um, alcohol, oil, salt, liquid oils, and salt. My concern is, should I um, follow up on the, and it was a very short blip of SVT. Should I follow up on that? So during your sleep study, you had a short run of a superventricular tachycardia. Mm -hmm. uh, now you say short run, it was short enough for them to count the beats. It was like a minute or 10 beats or something like that. Did they According to the report, it, it looks like it was enough to count the beats. Okay. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to say in general. What I tend to, to tell my patients is the following is, you know, I also follow up on something like that, uh, but also follow, I follow up in two ways. I may repeat some cardiac monitoring, not just a sleep study, but I'll just do uh, for my patient. I would do, if I see something like that, then I would do a, say, a 21-day monitoring 
So a 24 hour hold trip plus another, you know, two or three weeks of cardiac monitoring with, you know, uh, outpatient telemetry. So that gives me an idea of the amount of, you know, arrhythmic burden. So, so that would be important to follow up from that standpoint. Another way you follow up on the arrhythmia is to look at electrolyte abnormalities, see if there's, um, you know, like I said before, magnesium deficiency and potassium, look at those electrolytes uh, to evaluate that. Then of course you want to look at the structure of the heart. Uh, you know, is there you know, heart failure? Is there not heart failure? So you want to, when you see an abnormality, you follow up on the abnormality by doing more testing to see, okay, is there more of that there? That's one. Then two, you follow up by looking at things that may be associated with that, maybe causative agents, electrolyte abnormalities, or uh, structural heart abnormalities that may predispose someone having this uh, SVT. And SVT, again, you know, uh, that could be different mechanisms. So if someone has SVT, if I'm looking at a tracing, I'm going to say, well, is this, you know, AV nodal wrench and tachycardia? Is this concealed accessory pathway? Is this uh, multifocal ectopic atrial tachycardia? So the different mechanism of SVT and the different mechanisms will, 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 will predispose me to think of a different underlying uh, cause. I did have a, a stress test with injection. Um, after that, sometime afterwards, and it seemed to be okay, except for a little leaky, you know, valve. Okay. Yeah, and those things are good. You also want to make sure that the heart overall is structurally normal, because a structurally normal heart certainly is a good sign. You want to kind of look at this from a global problem. You see one small isolated problem, then what you should just step back and say, okay, what's the global condition uh, of the heart itself? And the global condition of the heart is that, well, you know, stress test is normal, heart pumping function is normal, you know, no ischemia, et cetera, et cetera. He said, okay, that's all, those are all things pointing in the right direction. And so this one electro abnormality could be due to elect uh, electro abnormality or something like that. And so you, you tend to be less worried about it if, you know, other aspects of cardiac function are normal. All right. Thank you so much. No, thanks for the question. Janine, would you like to ask a question and where are you from? Um, hello, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my name's Janine. I'm from New South Wales in Australia. Hi, Janine. Um, I listened to you talking about oils in the diet and it seems to me from, there seems to be a lot of confusion, at least in my mind. I listened to Udo Erasmus the other day and he was talking about um oils and having oils that are uncooked and eating that. And I know that we need the omega-3s and 6 and 9s, but if we just ate the whole food, like the um, the walnuts and so forth, is that enough for us? Should we be taking these supplements? Should we cut out all oils on salad dressings? I feel that there's a lot of mixed messages out there, um, particularly, you know, if you're looking for um, – overall health obviously for joint health for heart health for obesity i really don't know what to do <laughs> so no, i would I, like to listen to your point of view no i hear you and, and and you know and you're exactly right there's there's a lot of there are a lot of mixed messages and you know what what i would suggest people do is put things in the context so let me let me sort of give an example um and and let's take I'm going to get back to oils in a minute. I'm just going to use this example. My colleague and friend, Dr. Esselson, is really big on, okay, no avocados, no nuts and seeds, et cetera, no oil. Uh, but when you really talk to him, he'll say, well, you know, uh, you know, we're supposed to have these nuts and things are in a shell for a reason. It limits the amount that we eat. And so when you listen to that messaging, you know, it's not an absolute no nuts or no seeds. Uh, you know, if you really listen and you pin them down, you'll say, yeah, you can have this, me, this, that, and so on. Uh, but but the the major messaging is no no nuts and seeds because there's a many people will then take that and say, well, I can have nuts and seeds. And so oftentimes a, a speaker or practitioner will say, okay, no nuts, no seeds, because that's what seeps through uh, and and that's what the person remembers. Back to the oils, you know, oils, there may be situations where oils are not harmful, but, but 
the ideal situation for oil would be in the context of the whole food. It's sort of like having a family together. And so you want to say, okay, the ideal situation for the oil is there. Now, you may have somebody, you know, who may not be able to convert, you know, uh, or break down these seeds in the way they need to be broken down uh, uh, to convert these oils into certain end products. Uh, but by and large, the whole foods are ideal. Sometimes whole foods are difficult to consume because chewing. Some people may not be able to chew these foods or break them down. Um, and so you might make a similar argument for uh, the nuts or seeds. People may not be able to break them down, be it some problem in the GI tract or the like. So there are there's circumstances where, you know, the whole food itself in a certain individual, in a certain context, may not be ideal. That's why we use juice feasting. Uh, we use blue green algaes that have their oils in them uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a liquid form so they're more easily absorbed. You may have a colleague come and say, well, I don't believe in juices or smoothies. There, there's too much sugar. But if you're using the whole food, mixing with vegetables, it's cold pressed. You're not adding sugars. You're not boiling. You're not, you're not pasteurizing it. Then it is a minimally processed foods, and we've seen good results with that. And so back to the oils, the reason I say no oils is because if I were to come and say, look, you can have oils, but these are the circumstances. Ba, 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 ba. Yeah. These are, then somebody's, what are you going to, many people are going to hear, or well, Montgomery says I can have oil. And then you got, you go on Supermarket X and pull olive oil off the shelf that's, you know, olive oil brand X that's been sitting on the shelf for six months. Uh, it was heat extracted to start with. They add a little Crisco to top it off, and there you have the oil. And not to mention, you're going to start frying with it. Because the only thing you're going to remember Montgomery saying is, oil is okay. And you're not going to hear, pop, 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 pop. And so oftentimes the messaging has to be such that it's direct messaging. And so by and large, oils are not ideal foods because they're extracted from their natural you know, environment. And many of the good aspects of that food are left behind, lignans in the case of seeds and nuts or the like. So that's where you hear oils. But they're, they're I mean, some patients, well, you know, you can get certain type of olive oils processed in a certain way to be beneficial. I'm not aware of those studies. And there may be studies showing the benefit in certain circumstances. Uh, so I, I will allow oils if you're having it in the form of a vitamin D supplement or something like that. But by and large, I think the messaging is consistent. No oils, no processed oils. And even people say you can't have oils. If you quiz them, say, well, can I fry my vegetables in oil? I bet they would say for the most part, no. And so that's where you get the common denominator of the messaging, right? Because it's the processing of the oil. So you hear Montgomery say no oils at all. I'm thinking of the oil that's sitting on the shelf that's been there for six months and it undergoes a natural processing. And that person that says oil's okay in this circumstances are not really talking about that. And so you can find what I would suggest to find the common denominator in what we're saying. We're all saying no processed oil. But when I say no oil, I'm looking at most oils on the shelf are processed by one means or another. Thank you very much. Thanks. Hope that clears that up. <laughs> yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's more confusion. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm not more confused. I think I'm just a little bit more annoyed at the mixed messaging that we, that sort of like is out yeah. there all the time, you know, and yeah. I find, yeah. find that confusing. Yeah, the mixed messaging is there. We we all come at this in different perspectives and we all have yeah. a different, uh, you know, when I listen to, when I listen to me and my colleague, many of my colleagues who will say, okay, I don't recommend this for this reason and that reason. I try to get the context in which they're speaking. And, 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 and it's easy for me to do that because I know my perspective and so I get an understanding for their perspective. I'm a big uh, proponent of eating a high percentage of raw foods and all raw if you're really sick and you can add cooked over time, uh, largely because raw foods are more healing and more healing rapidly. Now, somebody else would say, well, 
uh, there's data showing that you know certain carotenoids in carrots are more prevalent when you cook the carrots. Okay, that may be correct. However, just because a micronutrient A is more prevalent when it's cooked, there may be other micronutrients that we've yet to discover that's less prevalent. And then that exactly. cooked carrot may be more off balance than the raw carrot. So, so even that argument can, can you know, be a little bit incomplete. <laughs>